Hey there everyone, it's Mr. Lane here. And in this lecture we will look at art from the modernism and postmodernism period in Europe and America from 1945 to 1980. Take good notes and let's begin. Key ideas include that artists had really developed their own styles and were quick to accept new technologies. There was a rise in the avant-garde Although the term avant-garde was originally applied to innovative approaches to art making in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it is applicable to all art that pushes the boundaries of ideas and creativity, and is still used today to describe art that is radical or reflects originality of vision. Next we have the Armory Show of 1913, Stieglitz Gallery 291, pop art, feminist art, environmental or earth or site art, and lastly, new media. Army Show of 1913. On February 17, 1913, an art exhibition opened in New York City that shocked the country. It changed our perception of beauty and had a profound effect on artists and collectors. It marked the dawn of modernism in America. It was the first time the phrase avant-garde was used to describe painting and sculpture. The critics described the experimental art as insane, but the media attention drew crowds and collectors that took notice. Stieglitz Gallery 291. An influential and prolific photographer, Alfred Stieglitz produced thousands of pictures throughout his career, covering numerous themes that captured different periods of rapid transition in American society. In addition to his photography, he was a vital force in the development of modern photography and modern art in general in America. Working as an art dealer, exhibition organizer, publisher, and editor. He published the periodical camera work and formed the exhibition society the photo secession and ran a series of influential galleries most notably the little galleries of the photo secession better known as 291 gallery. Here's a list of artworks we'll be looking at from this period. Here's our list of key terms. Modernism refers to a global movement in society and culture that formed the early decades of the 20th century, sought a new alignment with the experiences and values of modern industrial life. Other characteristics include a rejection of history and conservative values. It was driven by social and political agendas. It was innovative and experimental with form. And lastly, had an emphasis on materials, techniques, and processes. Postmodernism can be seen as a reaction against the ideas and values of modernism. Anything goes. It was controversial and confrontational. And lastly, they refused to recognize the authority of any single style or definition of what art should be. Our first subcategory, environmental art, is art that addresses social and political issues relating to the natural and urban environment. This video is about an artist named Patrick Doherty, who I had the pleasure of working with while in grad school. Here's 
Here's a picture of Patrick Doherty's Deep in the Heart installation located at Texas A&M University Commerce. Here's a cool picture with me, Patrick, my professor, and other classmates from grad school. Jackson Pollock was an American painter. In 1947, he started dripping, flinging, splattering, and pouring paint onto his canvases that were spread across the floor. His paintings today can sell for $50 million. Below these abstract paintings used to be narrative content, but Pollock would paint over them. To a considerable degree, Pollock controlled his flow of paint and distribution of color. He knew what type of motions and what tools and paint produced certain results. Many people were impressed by his radical approach to painting, like the Museum of Modern Art and art critics. Pollock became a larger-than-life figure thanks to media attention. New needs need new techniques. Today, painters do not have to go to a subject matter outside of themselves. They work from a different source. They work from within. Pollock's art can be described as abstract expressionism which was a pursuit of abstraction as a means to convey emotion. Our next artist is Marth Rocco. As stated by Rothko, we assert man's absolute emotions. We don't need props or legends. We create images whose realities are self-evident. Free ourselves from memory, association, nostalgia, legend, myth. Instead of making cathedrals out of Christ, man, or life, we make it out of ourselves, out of our own feelings. The image we produce is understood by anyone who looks at it without nostalgic glasses of history. Rothko uses color alone to draw out emotion. He got rid of anything that triggered history or memory or narrative and tried to create a sensory experience for the viewer by monumentality, simplicity, and stillness. Many describe standing before a Rothko painting as a religious experience. Here's a link to a video where you can see an inside view of the Rothko Chapel, which is actually located here in Houston. Here are a couple of questions to contemplate. Now let's look at pop art. Pop art is an art movement that emerged in the 1950s and flourished in the 1960s in America and Britain, drawing inspiration from sources in popular and commercial culture. Jasper Johns was an artist that came onto the scene in the 1950s. Much of the work that he created led the American public away from the Expressionism form and towards an art movement, a form known as the concrete. He would depict many flags and maps, and this created a more distinct style with the work that was being done during the period in American art history. He was also one of the leading forces to the pop form known as minimalism. Even to this day, many of the pieces that are sold at auction bring in extremely high price tags and sell for record amounts.
Let's look at Jasper Johns painting Three Flags, done in 1958. Here are three questions to consider as we analyze the work of Jasper Johns. In 1954, Jasper Johns began painting what would become one of his signature emblems, the American flag. As an iconic image, comparable to the targets, maps, and letters that he also depicted, Johns realized that the flag was seen and not looked at, not examined. The work's structural arrangement adds to its complexity. The trio of flags, each successfully diminished in scale by about 25%, projects outward. As he remarked, this painting allowed him to go beyond the limits of the flag and to have a different canvas space. Chuck Close is globally renowned for reinvigorating the art of portrait painting from the late 1960s to the present day. An era when photography had been challenging painting's former dominance in this area and succeeding in steadily gaining critical appropriation, appreciation as an artistic medium in its own right. Close emerged from the 1970s painting movement of photorealism, also known as superrealism, but then moved well beyond its initially hyperattentive rendering of a given subject to explore how methodical, system-driven portrait painting based on photography's underlying processes could suggest a wide range of artistic and philosophical concepts. In addition, Close's personal struggle with dyslexia and partial paralysis have suggested real life parallels to his professional discipline. As though his methodical and yet also quite intuitive methods of painting are inseparable from his own daily reckoning with his body's own vulnerable material condition. Gross's portraits encourage viewers to focus more on the formal aspects of the images than in traditional portraits. How did he achieve this effect? After taking a picture of his subjects, Close makes photographic prints that he uses to transfer the images to canvas. Utilizing a technology devised by Renaissance masters and adapted by contemporary billboard painters. Close overlays a working print with a numbered, a numbered and lettered grid and then reproduces the image block by block. In this format, the image becomes a mosaic of black, gray, and white visual information that the artist replicates by spraying a mixture of black acrylic paint and water onto the canvas with an airbrush. Specific features like the illusion of light reflecting off the hairs of his head beard were achieved by scratching paint from the surface of the canvas with a razor blade. Big Cell Portrait was the first of Close's non-signature series of monumental head and shoulder portraits. Here's a video of Close discussing his self-portrait. Feminist art is art by artists made consciously in the light of development in feminist art theory in the early 1970s. Judy Chicago is an artist, author, feminist, educator, and intellectual whose career now spans five decades. Her influence both within and beyond the art community is attested to by her illusion, inclusion in hundreds of publications throughout the world. Her art has been frequently exhibited in the United States as well as in Canada, Europe, Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. In addition, a number of the books she has authored have been published in foreign editions 
bringing her art and philosophy to readers worldwide. We are going to now look at Judy Chicago's piece, The Dinner Party, made in 1979. The Dinner Party, an important icon of 1970s feminist art and a milestone in 20th century art, is presented as a centerpiece around which the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art is organized. The Dinner Party comprises a massive ceremonial banquet arranged on a triangular table with a total of 39 place settings, each commemorating an important woman from history. The names of another 999 women are inscribed in gold on the white tile floor below the triangular table. The shaped triangle is important because it serves as a symbol of equality. Here's a video of Judy Chicago talking more about her art. The next artist we will look at is Cindy Sherman. Here are a couple of questions to consider as you look at some of Cindy Sherman's photographs. I like characters who are not smiling. They're sort of blank, Sherman remarked. It makes a viewer come up with the narrative. Untitled Film Stills is a suite of 70 black and white photographs in which the artist posed in the guises of various generic female film characters, among them the working girl and lonely housewife, staged to resemble scenes from 1950s and 60s Hollywood. By photographing herself in such roles, Sherman inserts herself into a dialogue about stereotypical portrayals of women. Whether she was the one to release the camera's shutter or not, she is considered the author of the photographs. However, the work is untitled film stills are not considered self-portraits. These black and white pictures explore the stereotypes of film. You see Sherman herself posing in a variety of guises that refer to the publicity still, usually shot on set and used to advertise a film. She's referring to 1950s and 60s film, B-movies, or European art house films. However, none of these photographs depict actual films. These are completely fictional moments that are made to look like stills. The success of this body of work is in the seemingly endless variation of female types that Sherman has presented to us. The girl on the run, the bombshell, the bored housewife, the vamp. Sherman has mined these stereotypes to great effect and presented us with a variety of characters that are familiar but also spark our own narrative. While the photographs can be appreciated individually, their success really is in their multiplicity, an encyclopedia or a cataloging of female types. All of these photographs were set up kind of guerrilla style. She carried around a little suitcase with a wig or some costumes, and then quickly she would turn into that persona, snap a few pictures, and then develop them. One of the hallmarks of this body of work is that the prints themselves are in a way unremarkable. These were made by Sherman to seem cheap, like throwaway prints. The publicity still was 8 by 10 inches, glossy, it wasn't treated like an artwork, and the format of these untitled film stills mimics that. As stated by Frank Lloyd Wright, the mission of an architect is to help people understand how to make life more beautiful, the world a better one for living in.
and to give reason, rhyme, and meaning to life. One of Frank Lloyd Wright's most famous structures is Falling Water from 1935, located in Pennsylvania. Here's a link to a website about Falling Water where you can learn much more information. Interesting fact, Frank Lloyd Wright also has a house in Houston that's up for sale. Another famous work by Frank Lloyd Wright is the Guggenheim Museum. Our last piece is by Joseph Kosuth, One in Three Chairs from 1965. I'll let you take some time to develop your own opinion about this piece. Thanks for watching everyone. Here are some additional resources for you to access.